Hello, and welcome to How to Win, the Vandenberg Coalition series on challenges facing the United States military and the Department of Defense in an era of great power competition. Today, we're discussing America's nuclear arsenal. Here to discuss with me is Marshall Billingsley. Marshall is currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, focusing on illicit finance and arms control. Prior to joining Hudson, he served as the Special Presidential Envoy for Arms Control at the U.S. Department of State, where he held the rank of ambassador. Before joining the State Department, he was the Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing at Treasury. He also served as Commissioner on the 2023 Strategic Posture Report. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd like to start our discussion with a level set question. You were a part of the 2023 Strategic Posture Commission, which was an update of the 2009 uh, Commission Report. And the strategic environment looks incredibly different. Would you mind telling us a little bit about what the threat environment looks like? It's great to be with you. And um, yes, it, it, the report that we issued, which was a uh, is a bipartisan unanimous uh, uh, consensus document, uh, wherein all six uh, Republican nominated commissioners and all six Democrat commissioners agreed um, on a series of both findings and recommendations uh, regarding the threat environment and the strategic posture the United States needs to deter our adversaries. The 2023 report is radically different than the 2009 assessment. And the reasons for that uh, are because the security, the security situation in the world has gotten markedly worse. Um, we're dealing with a Russia that continues to build nuclear weapons in, in uh, great numbers um, and has a, a number of a wide range, a wide arsenal, uh, the most diverse nuclear arsenal in the world. And China has now, unlike in 2009, China has now emerged as a arms racing nuclear power, clearly intent on achieving at a minimum parity with the United States, if not, if not perhaps supremacy. Right. So there's been a buildup of Russian short range systems and a Chinese buildup across the board. And at the same time, we've had about 40 years of a lack of investment so how did we get here and how did we let this happen? We got here through a notable lack of a sense of urgency and a notable lack of prioritization by, uh, by political leadership, both Republican and Democrat. Um, president Trump really was the first uh, uh, president in certainly in my lifetime to really prioritize the nuclear deterrent. Um, but we have allowed all of our systems to fall into obsolescence. Uh, the Minuteman 3 uh, system is a good example. Um, but the B2 is the youngest element of our triad, and that, that debuted back in the 80s. Um, we're, in a, we're at a point now where we simply cannot continue to extend the lifespan of these systems. We have to have replacement capabilities. Um, and we're facing this, uh, this shortfall in capability precisely at the moment when the number of threats facing us is surging. So we're in a very, very, we're entering a very dangerous period. And, you know, sort of shifting gears specifically to focus on one of our adversaries, that's certainly not the case when it comes to China. They're on track to reach quantitative parity with the United States in deployed nuclear warheads by the mid-2030s. Um, but at the same time, their nuclear doctrine is sufficiently opaque and they don't have experience when it comes to risk reduction. So when we're considering how to counter them as an adversary, what should we be looking for? What should we be doing? Well, I think it's important that we continue to try to engage the Chinese and to talk to them, uh, not because I think we should expect that arms control will offer any solution to this problem, but because, as you point out, they have zero experience with what they're about to do. Uh, and the risk of miscalculation, if they, we believe they're moving to a launch on warning posture, and the risk of, of miscalculation uh, is, is very much uh, serious when, when you have that kind of posture. Even after decades and decades of risk reduction talks, we even have a, an automated system. We, we notify the Russians of ballistic missile launches, they uh, theoretically tell us as well. Um, we have data exchanges. And even with that many, many decades of Cold War arms control of the Soviets, the Russians nearly launched uh, back in the 90s when the Norwegians sent up a sounding rocket. So we need to talk to the Chinese to make sure that they understand what they're wading into. Uh, 
But we also need to make sure that they understand that we will field additional forces and that we will be able to hold them at risk just as we can hold the Russians at risk. One of the major breakthroughs that has now happened in Washington because of our Posture Commission's assessment, because it was a bipartisan assessment, is the recognition that has set in that we can no longer treat China as a lesser included case of Russia. We have to be prepared to treat them uh, as an adversary that may engage in coordinated, simultaneous, or opportunistic aggression. And the Chinese need to understand that. So I want to touch on the fact that China can no longer be considered a lesser nuclear power. How do we continue to address the growing number of targets while recognizing that, you know, we need to adequately balance our resources? Well, my personal view is that we're not spending enough on defense in general. And what the commission's view is that our conventional capabilities have to be adequately resourced because if they're not, and I would submit they're not currently, uh, it drives our reliance on our nuclear deterrent. And no one really wants that. Um, so there are a number of things that we must do across the board. And, and, and the reason that it was called the Strategic Posture Commission, not the Nuclear Posture Commission, is that there are many other capabilities that are, need to be brought to bear uh, to deter adversaries. And so when you read the report, you'll see a, a wide range of recommendations, including, for instance, um, the recommendation that we get far more serious about hypersonic warheads, that we begin to field intermediate range ballistic and cruise missile systems, which we were prohibited from doing uh, for so many years under the INF Treaty, um, the need to significantly augment our missile defenses. So a major recommendation that hasn't gotten a lot of attention that the commission made is that we need to be able to protect the American people from a limited coercive strike. Uh, that is not something historically that the Democrat Party has been in favor of. In fact, they were many of my fellow commissioners uh, were very fond of the ABM tree back in the day um, and vociferously protested when we withdrew from it under the Bush administration. Uh, they've now come around, particularly given Putin's um, saber rattling that he continues to do just even yesterday, uh, to, to realize that, in fact, we, we should have missile defenses, including the possibility of space-based systems, which are now potentially more, more available and more capable and more affordable than they ever were before, even back when Ronald Reagan proposed you know, so-called Star Wars, that we were going to need a mix of the offensive and defensive capabilities and a wide range of offsetting conventional capabilities, too. So I want to turn later to conventional um, weapons again before we, you know, let China off the hook. Um, speaking in particular about the participation in the INF Treaty, China was not a participant. So they were able to develop um, a large variety of intermediate range missiles, which are now pointed at Taiwan. Um, so when we talked a little bit earlier about imposing costs and understanding that costs will be imposed, how should we be um, messaging to China in this particular in this particular avenue? Well, you're exactly right. Um, and, and they've got more than a dozen different kinds of ballistic and cruise missile systems in that 1,500 to 5,000 kilometer range. Because as you, as you point out, they were never prohibited under the INF Treaty. They weren't a party to the INF Treaty. Now, that doesn't mean that China doesn't cheat on its arms control agreements. They sure do. But um, in this particular case, it was Russia that was cheating, uh, clandestinely developing and even deploying systems that violated the INF Treaty, which is why President Trump ultimately had no choice but to, to, but to uh, remove the U.S. from that treaty. The vast majority of the Chinese weapons are, as you say, pointed at, at Taiwan, not all of them. It's kind of interesting to ask where else do they point these medium-range systems. Um, but the vast majority and what we are, are doing and need to do more of is field theater uh, missile defense capabilities. Um, that will be able to protect uh, both the Taiwanese, the Koreans, the Japanese. The Japanese are building their own missile defense system, as well as our fleet, as well as our Navy. Further, uh, I would suggest what's good for the goose is good for the, the gander. And we should look at uh, deployment options uh, of our own conventional medium range capabilities if we get serious about fielding them in sufficient quantities. Right. 
Um, so turning, you touched briefly on, on Russia and their actions in Ukraine. Um, so Russia maintains the largest nuclear weapons stockpile, and they would use that doctrine of limited first use to coerce termination to a war on terms amenable to what they would like to see happen. Um, So how should we be thinking about this with their ongoing war in Ukraine and what seems like the Biden administration's perpetual fear of escalation? The Russian doctrine uh, has often been called, and I think very accurately, escalate to de-escalate. And that kind of summarizes Russian behavior across the board. Uh, They very, they find themselves free to act in escalatory ways all the time. The Biden administration's hallmark has been a paranoia, a fear of escalation, and as a result, sort of a spinelessness when it comes to to deterring Russian actions. And you can see it in in every aspect of how the Biden administration has approached Russia policy. You see it in the sanctions regime and the fact that they have been deathly afraid of targeting Russian oil exports. They haven't done it. They came up with a uh, a performative piece of art called the price cap. And the result is that Russia continues to rake in for its war machine, 800, 900 million euros a day in revenue. You see it in the halting, grudging uh, provision of military capabilities to the Ukrainians. Remember, the Biden administration didn't want to provide javelins, and then they didn't want to provide stingers, and then they didn't want to provide harpoons or HIMARS or other artillery systems, let alone attack them or F-16s. They have sort of been dragged into this by our allies at the speed of shame. The Biden administration needs to learn how to escalate on its own. We should be comfortable with escalation as long as it's done in a way that clearly signals to the Russians what our red lines are and what shall not be crossed. Well, speaking of red lines, um, you mentioned earlier that Russia has always cheated on our arms control um, arrangements, and a lot of it is in in order to tie the United States hand behind behind our back. So why do we continue to let them do this, and what can we do to avoid it in the future? Well, we need to stop signing on to bad, unverifiable treaties, right? Um, the Biden administration came into office, uh, threw away all the leverage that we left them in the negotiations with the Russians over the New START treaty, and they simply unilaterally offered to extend it for five years. Now, guess who's violating the New START Treaty? The Russians. Um, I'm not terribly bent out of shape over that because it wasn't much of a treaty to begin with, uh, completely unverifiable. Um, Not completely, but largely unverifiable. So the lack of the on-site inspections doesn't doesn't particularly concern me. But we are entering an era, as the Posture Commission noted, uh, we're entering an area where the prospects for arms control um, look fairly remote. Uh, in part because it makes little sense to have a follow-on uh, nuclear treaty with just the Russians when the Chinese are racing to parity. And of course, the Chinese have shown zero interest in negotiating on anything until they achieve that parity. Um, but in the future, we, we, we absolutely cannot sign up to inequitable deals. Another example of the failure of the New START treaty was that it didn't cover uh, more than 60% of the Russian arsenal, which is on the shorter range uh, Nuclear landmines, nuclear torpedoes, nuclear weapons here, there, and yonder. Um, They have more than 2,000 of those kinds of weapons, and the New START Treaty only covers 1,500 of the strategic systems. So that's just a for instance of of the kinds of things that would have to be addressed in any future arms control arrangement. Right. And, you know, the Russians uh, perpetually make investments in their nuclear arsenal. So I want to turn now to our investments or lack thereof, in particular, you know, how that's potentially affecting us. Um, You know, one of the things that strikes me about the strategic posture view is that it wasn't necessarily about achieving a specific number, but rather an effective um, deterrence. So what are some areas that we could improve our policies or force structure in order to be more effective? Uh, You're you're absolutely right. And and I, I think there, in fact, the commission did not uh, recommend necessarily a quantitative uh, increase, uh, but said rather either quantitative or qualitative or both uh, in the number and, and types of systems that we have. Um, I think what what we decided, I know what we decided with the Posture Commission is that we're, we're entering a period where because these investments have been deferred for so long, the, the just-in-time delivery of capability is actually not proving to be in time. 
And as we're seeing significant uh, programmatic problems with the, the Sentinel missile, which is the replacement system for the Minuteman III ICBM, with the Columbia-class submarine, which is the submarine that will ultimately replace the Ohio-class submarines, um, that we actually will have to do a number of other things to offset a real decline in capability. And those other things that the commission recommended include, for instance, um, retaining the Ohio-class submarines for longer than we originally planned. There's a price tag that goes with that. Reconverting a number of the tubes uh, on the Ohio-class submarines that were welded shut to comply with these new start limitations. Reconverting uh, a large number of the B-52 bombers, uh, which are, you know, these bombers have been around for, what, 80 years or so? I mean, and they'll be around for the next 100, I suppose, um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, we will need to economize and, and, and stretch the capabilities that we do have to the maximum extent possible. But we also have to look at additional new types of additional capability. And here, I would suggest that uh, the, one of the things the commission recommended is that we look yet again at the possibility of a road mobile ICBM, since we came to the conclusion that probably digging more missile silos uh, in the continental United States is probably not feasible. Um, Chinese, by the way, have more missile silos today than we do. Just let that sink in for a second. But other things, we uh, specifically said that we need a new type of um, theater nuclear capability, and we described the attributes of that system. Uh, the commission did not choose to identify specifically a sea launch cruise missile, uh, nuclear tip sea launch cruise missile as the solution, but when you look at the attributes that we did agree upon, it would seem to meet all those criteria. Right. You mentioned the need for just kind of across the board defense investment. Um, and, you know, we need substantial investment in what seems like almost every area. So when we're thinking about these decisions, how do we go about making prioritizing and, um, you know, determining where cuts need to be made? Well, the, the situation we're in with the arrangements made in the House of Representatives um, could severely affect our ability to, to adequately fund our defense enterprise. We are, as a nation, below 4% of our GDP uh, being spent on defense. There is some talk now in Washington of needing to move to 5% or more, which are, which are the spending levels that we had uh, during the Cold War. Uh, one of our big problems is that our weapon systems have all become grossly expensive. Um, and so looking at ways to take cost out of our acquisition programs um, and to also recognize that quantity uh, has a quality all of its own as well, and that maybe sometimes we don't need the gold-plated capability. Silver, silver will do just fine. Um, but in my mind, we we definitely need to look at increasing our defense expenditures. And like I said, especially in the conventional field, because the, without with shortfalls in conventional capabilities, that reliance on the nuclear deterrent goes up. Right. And so sort of on the flip side of that, I've heard some arguments um, that we need to invest more deeply and, and focus on arms control in order to save money to reduce the number and reduce the number of nuclear weapons in the world. Given our atrophying arsenal, is that possible? Is that something, is that valid at all? It's not valid. Yeah, I figured you'd say that, but I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> For the, for the reasons I laid out, mm -hmm. um, the prospects, and again, it was the consensus, unanimous view of the commission that we're not going to arms control. Now, maybe something radical changes in the world that makes arms control once again feasible. I certainly would hope to see such a, a day, but it's a pretty gloomy prospects for solving this arms race. We're not arms racing. The United States is not engaged in an arms race, but Russia and China are, and they have been for quite a while. Right. So then I think a lot of the problem then becomes meshing to the American people because the American people sort of has this aversion to the use of nuclear weapons. Um, but the fact is that we use nuclear weapons every day to deter and provide assurances. So in terms of um, providing, you know, themes of why this is important and messaging to the American people, what do you think is the most important thing to communicate? I, I think the American people know uh, and have seen very clearly over the last three and a half years that the the international order that we created, the United States, with our allies after the Second World War, which has been an order that has been uh, uh, greatly advantageous to the American people, uh, to our way of life, to our economy, 
uh, that this way, uh, this this order is under assault. It is under attack by regimes like the Russians, the communist Chinese, the Iranians, the North Koreans, uh, who want to 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 they want a rules based order, but they want r their rules. And no one is going to enjoy living under communist Chinese rules. I can promise you that. And so it's to that end that maintenance of our strategic posture becomes so vital. It's vital to our way of life and to the safety and the security, not just of the American people, but our friends and our allies too. So then one final question, how should a future administration be thinking about preserving America's uh, future and the current world order? A future administration should take the Strategic Posture Commission report, slap a cover letter on it, and say this is our nuclear posture recommendations and move swiftly to implement every single bipartisan recommendation made in it. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's good to be with you.